Hello, good evening. Okay, so welcome uh, to our lecture. Okay, so hope you all enjoyed uh, today's first uh, outdoors mask off day. All right. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people still prefer to wear masks. Okay, from what I saw. Okay, so uh, let's uh, hope for things to get better. All right. Um, yeah, I think from the looks of it, even uh, I'm not sure whether you saw latest uh, circular from NUS about the updated uh, safe management measures. All right. So I think we are more or less opening up quite a bit. Okay. Uh, so most likely next semester onwards, everything will be back to campus. Okay. Uh, I think this will probably be the last uh, semester of uh, Zoom classes and uh, uh, any form of uh, online uh, assessment and things like that. Okay. So. Yeah, so I think it would be good to have everybody back on campus. Yep. Um, so for today's, uh, for this module, basically, we are nearing the end. Okay. Um, so this, uh, today's topic is going to be the last chapter that we have to cover, which is on virtual memory. Okay. Uh, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this topic of virtual memory. And after that, uh, we're going to have some discussion on the, uh, again, any queries and discussion about the assignment two and the term paper, okay? And then uh, next week is, is going to be a short one. I'm just going to go through some questions, okay? For this uh, uh, this last two topics on scheduling and uh, uh, this virtual memory. So some tutorial questions I'll prepare and send to you all. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also go through some partial questions, okay? So you have a idea of the type of questions that were set and things like that. All right, uh, so I think last week I talked about the exam. Okay, I will also uh, put up that slide again uh, at the end of the lecture. Okay, so any questions we can discuss uh, at the end. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started with uh, today's topic on virtual memory. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, virtual memory, okay, so generally when we talk about computing systems, there are two types of uh, memory uh, enhancements that all platforms will have. Okay, one is virtual memory and the other one is cache. Okay, they are both actually very, very similar. Okay, very, very similar in terms of uh, the idea behind it. Okay, uh, the key difference is uh, in terms of uh, virtual memory, we say you sort of manage through the OS, okay, whereas in the uh, idea of the cache, it is managed uh, through the hardware, okay, uh, but the underlying uh, principle behind it, the way it works is actually the same, okay, the concept is the same. Okay, so let's look at this idea of virtual memory, all right, so we want to understand what is virtual memory okay, and uh, some idea of the memory hierarchy in the system, okay, and how virtual memory actually is implemented and how we are able to use this virtual memory when we run our system. Okay, so let's first look at some memory concepts. Okay, so the DRAM okay, in the system, all right, uh, is basically the working memory set. Okay, so in any computing platform, you have the permanent storage, all right, which is like the hard disk or the flash or whatever. Okay, and then you need to run the code and keep your data uh, while the system is alive. All right, so for that we need DRAM. And uh, basically, if you look at the DRAM, all right, uh, historically it has always been the the case where the capacity, okay, growth is is far uh, or is greater than the bandwidth growth. All right, so of course, uh, when you look at it in just one year, it doesn't seem much, but when you compound the effect, you'll see that the the gap is quite big over the years. All right, so as years go by, the capacity, that means the amount of storage that you can squeeze into the DRAM's uh, cell of the same size is, is a lot more, but the bandwidth, that means the speed at which you can transact with the DRAM is a lot slower. Okay, so that is an issue. Okay, so, and why is that important? Because uh, it gives this huge performance gap between the processor and the RAM. Okay, so if you look at this graph, it sort of gives you the idea that over the years, okay, uh, CPU, okay, the, the, the rate at which we can uh, improve the performance of the CPU itself is, 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 is quite high. Okay, so the performance is, is really growing at a very high rate. All right, whereas the memory, okay, 
the the performance okay so we talk about performance we talking about the access okay the time that you need to do any form of transaction okay so the rate at which the memory performance has been growing is a lot more slower okay compared to that of the cpu all right so that is uh, an issue right? because for any computing system you need the cpu okay to be of course uh, high performing but a cpu alone a good cpu alone is not enough but right? you need to have all the entire sort of subsystem and interfacing all to be able to perform at the same level okay then the whole system performance goes up all right so if you just have a cpu that is very very good but your memory is very slow then you are still slowed down anyway all right so it's just like the processor is always waiting okay to uh, for the memory to update and, and uh, respond okay before it can do the next instruction okay so this is of course an issue right but do we have alternatives yes we have alternatives right which is the sram okay so if you uh, look at sram and dram they both have the same idea that you want to keep some storage in the uh, in the system while it is still uh, functioning okay so in the past okay many years back uh, most systems uh, most computers used to come with sramps all right so uh, if you look up at the old uh, desktop if you open up you have all these card slots where you put in sram uh, sram bus all right and then you can just easily upgrade and so on okay um, the main issue with uh, sram is the density is low okay that means the amount of memory you get within that chip of a, of a particular size is quite low okay and it means that if you want more memory the overall cost also goes up okay but its access is extremely fast okay access is very fast okay but it's very low density which means the cost is high whereas the dram Okay, uh, has the ability to have a lot higher density. Okay, so in terms of the structure, okay, so we're not going to go into the structure. Okay, but if you look at this SRAM, it basically consists of a lot of these transistors. Okay, so if you're not sure what is transistor, it's fine. Okay, it's just a electronic building block. Okay, uh, that is used to control the flow of current and sort of control voltages at different points. Okay, so you have a lot of transistors, which means that the overall uh, footprint of each sram cell is a lot higher okay whereas over here you can in the, in the dram cell okay if you look at the uh, design it is just one transistor and one capacitor okay so you can see that the structure okay only has two components so you can squeeze a lot more of these cells in that same sort of a uh, footprint in terms of the uh, silicon okay so the density is very high okay but it is slow access Okay, so this is uh, an alternative, but it's a very expensive alternative, all right. And if you go further, okay, most of our memory, uh, most of our storage is in, uh, okay, used to be of course hard disk drive, all right. Uh, but I think in recent cases, uh, we are almost going fully into SSD, all right. So I mean, we still have uh, desktops and laptops still uh, supporting hard disk drive, okay, because they're still a lot more cheaper, all right. Uh, but I believe in a few years' time, probably this will also be phased out. Okay, once the SSD cost uh, starts to come down even further. Okay, so in terms of the whole memory hierarchy, okay, you can see that okay, uh, we have hard disk, all right, which is a lot of storage, okay, but it's very slow. All right, you want to access anything, it takes a considerable amount of time. Okay, and then you have your DRAM and SRAM, okay, where you have uh, sort of working memory that means while you're application is running you keep a copy of that that information the code everything okay but again it is uh, expensive okay uh, but it's a lot faster and the fastest memory of course in a sense is the register okay so if you look at your mips for example okay when you have all these registers s0 s1 t0 t1 and so on so those registers are also considered memory elements in a sense right? because they help to keep data for you within the processor okay but again it's also very very limited because you can only work with the amount of registers you have okay uh, of course sometimes you may think okay why don't i just since i need so much of memory okay, why don't i just uh, dump all this uh, memory that i need into my processor okay then what happens then your processor becomes extremely big 
okay, in terms of the size and also becomes extremely expensive. Okay, so, and what would happen is, well, if you do something like that, okay, then you uh, are also limiting the flexibility that you want uh, sort of uh, manufacturers and designers to have. Okay, that means they, they are stuck that okay, if I buy this processor from you, I already have to be uh, buying together as a package so much of memory, so much of hard disk space and everything because everything is in one chip. Okay, so, uh, so most manufacturers don't want to do that. Okay, uh, but of course, if you look at um, Apple, for example, when they came up with their own chips, okay, the performance was, of course, a lot, lot better than earlier on when they were using Intel chips. All right, and one of the reasons is because it is a custom made chip for their own platform, they don't have to think about selling it to anybody else, right? Because when they design the M1 chip or M2 chip, they are designing it for their own products, okay? So since they, they are their own market, that means they can decide how big, how much uh, space within the processor that they want to squeeze the memory and so on. So they can actually optimize the architecture, all right, to suit exactly what they want, okay? Instead of taking a general purpose processor from Intel or Motorola or anybody and trying to run their OS and run their, their applications on it. Okay, so generally, okay, uh, we need a lot of memory, okay, but the components that have a lot of memory like the hard disk and mem uh, DRAM and so on are either too slow or too expensive. Okay, so we uh, have to always deal with this issue. Okay, so generally what we want is we want this memory that is big and at the same time fast. Okay, we want a lot of memory, but you also want it to be fast. Okay, so how do we go about this? Okay, so the concept in any system is we use a hierarchy where we say that close to the CPU, we keep memory that is very fast, okay? But the closer you are to the CPU, the uh, more expensive it is, so you only can have a limited amount of memory. Okay, whereas the larger memory space, okay, you can keep it further away from the CPU. Okay, so there is a sort of hierarchy that uh, we have where the disk is at uh, the lowest level, the hard disk, okay, where you have a lot of size, a very little speed, and then it goes up on DRAM, SRAM, and finally the registers. Okay, now when we say that we keep a small portion of the data in smaller and faster memory. Okay, that means when we keep the data in the SRAM and the DRAM, okay, the speed is faster, all right? But as you can see, the size is smaller and smaller, okay? But uh, why does this help? Okay, why, why does this idea of trying to keep uh, keeping a small set of the memory closer to the processor work because of this uh, principle of locality? What is this principle of locality? It is the idea that in, in most software applications, majority of the time we are accessing a limited or a small portion of the memory address space, okay, uh, for a particular time interval, and then we go on to another space and so on. Right? So generally, we see th that this is a pattern in most uh, applications, okay. Uh, even if you run a program, okay, you always see that in most cases there are loops. Right? So you, if you look at it from the program, the code wise, you run a loop. Right? You run a loop, that means you run, execute line one, line two, line three, line four, line five, and then maybe you repeat. Okay? And then after that, after certain iterations, then you jump to some other portion of the code, and then maybe you jump back and so on, okay? So there will be cases where there is no loop, all right, you're just executing some sequential code, but then after that, there will be another sequence of some loops, all right? And in excess of the data, it's also the same thing, okay? Most of the data, though we have individual variables, okay, but uh, there will also be a lot of data structures that are arrays or lists, and when, it, when you look at arrays and so on, what happens is the data is always packed together. Right? That means if I access one uh, address, okay, memory address, I will most likely access another 
the next memory address will be somewhere close, somewhere nearby, and then again somewhere nearby, and so on. All right, so you can see that generally we have this idea of what we call temporal locality and spatial locality. Okay, temporal means if I access this data right now, there's a high chance that I will also access it again somewhere in the near future. Okay, so again, then there's the other concept of spatial locality. That means if uh, the item has been accessed uh, in, in some memory address, I will most likely also reference other memory locations around this address. Okay, so in terms of the time, okay, and in terms of the space, okay, you observe that there is this locality. Okay, uh, but again, it's not that your whole program is in a loop, all right, and it's an array, but there will be pockets of uh, instances in your code where this uh, happens quite regularly. Okay, so this concept of locality actually helps us. Why? Because if you take a snapshot of your entire execution of the program, okay, that means you will take just a window. Okay, then you can see that, yes, within a window, you may observe some uh, locality. Okay, so over here, for example, you can see that I'm accessing this particular uh, lines of code again and again. Okay, then in terms of the data also, you can see that I am accessing a sequential set of data and things like that. Okay, so within a working set, I mean, within a short uh, window of time, you can observe that there is this locality. Okay, so now with this locality, okay, uh, what we can do is we can make uh, or take advantage of this in developing this concept of either the cache or the virtual memory. All right, so in terms of uh, going to this next stage, all right, what we want is we want to first uh, understand that you can firstly uh, use maybe some understanding of the way memory is arranged, okay, to make things more efficient. Okay, so that is of course um, uh, what you call the programmer's responsibility, okay, where you have the idea. So when you write your code, for example, okay, if you can make maximum use of internal registers in your code, okay, then you can. Uh, minimize the access time. All right, it is minimize the amount of access you have to the external memory and try to do everything within the uh, code itself. I mean, within the internal registers. Okay, so for example, okay, so if I have, let's say, five variables, okay, A, B, C, D, E, I have five variables in my code. Okay, and if you're writing assembly language code, all right, then you, uh, in the very first instance, you would want to do a load, okay, uh, of all these variables into your memory, and only when everything is done, then you do a store back, okay. But if you every time load, then store, load, then store, load, then store, okay, a lot of times, okay, after each operation, then you realize that you will actually end up wasting a lot of time just because of the load and the stop, okay. So that is, of course, things that are what you call visible to the programmer. So as a programmer, if you can, if you're writing in the lower and lower level uh, register uh, assembly language, then you can try to uh, improve the way you the style of coding so that you maximize the registers you have. Okay. Now the other one is transparent to the programmer. Okay. So where the OS, okay, or the compiler sort of uh, looks into how to maximize the uh, memory, okay, uh, to, to map with the sort of application you're trying to run. Okay, so how do we do this? So the, the two ways are what you call the cache and the virtual memory. Okay, so within the um, uh, hard disk, okay, you have your main storage, okay, where you have your code, you have everything written there. But once I want to run an application, I need to make a copy of it into my uh, DRAM. Okay, so what the DRAM does is a DRAM is actually a smaller set of memory compared to your hard disk. Okay, so your actual hard disk has a lot of space, has a lot of applications, and so on. But your actual memory that you work with 
is actually quite small. Okay, when it's a VRAM. Okay, and that idea of taking content from your hard disk and storing it in your DRAM is what we call virtual memory, which is managed by the OS. Okay, so it's transparent to the programmer. Okay, the OS helps us to do this, okay, and the backend. Now, the other level, okay, which we are not covering, okay, but is a similar concept is taking a smaller subset of the DRAM and storing it inside SRAM. Okay, and that is what we call the cache. Okay, and this cache is usually within the uh, same chip as the CPU. Okay, and uh, this is hardware managed. Okay, so what we try to do is we try to keep Again, content that is regularly accessed uh, close to the CPU so that the access time is as minimum as possible. All right. Uh, so, both of these are again transparent to the programmer. Okay. The virtual memory is OS managed, whereas the cache is hardware managed. All right. So, this is the, again the idea of the hierarchy. Okay. From the uh, hard disk all the way to the CPU registers. Okay. So, this is just an example of. Uh, the overall structure. Okay, so if you look at a processor, okay, this is the processor, okay, the, the main core. Okay, and this is the hard disk. Okay, but between the processor and the hard disk, there can be many layers in between. Okay, where you have sort of storage spaces to keep copies of the main application in your disk. All right, and all of this, the intention is to make it as efficient as possible. To minimize the amount of time I'm trying to access the hard disk. Okay, because accessing the hard disk is the slowest. Okay, the slowest. So you want to minimize uh, this access as much as possible by trying to keep as much info as you can in other memory subsets that are closer to the processor. Okay, so this is an example okay, of the internal of the processor. Okay, so you have the actual processor cost, okay, and then you have this concept of uh, cache, all right, where you have internal memory within the processor, okay, to keep information that is uh, regularly accessed, all right, so again, these are just examples to show you how uh, these kind of things have been implemented in on the actual hardware, all right, whereas the, the uh, hard days or the SSD and so on is Typically, further away is a separate gate okay, from the processor, and you sort of interface it through either the bots connections themselves, or in this case, like the ribbon cable. Okay, so that gives us some perspective of uh, the idea of how a memory system works, okay, and uh, why we want this uh, hierarchy of memory subsystems, okay, to manage our whole. Uh, uh, platform. All right. So what we want to do is we want to uh, be able to make a portion of the hard disk look like memory. All right. So we know that uh, we need to execute our code. We need to access our variables. All right. And all of this needs to be stored inside what we call the main memory, which is a DRAM. Okay. But we do not want to fetch everything uh, at the same time because we may not have enough space. Okay, so what you want to do is you only want to fetch those parts of the application that we are currently accessing. Okay, again, this is because of this idea of locality. Okay, that means since I'm currently executing this part of the code and accessing this set of variables or memory, then that is what I want to transfer from my hard disk to my DRAM. Okay. Then later on, as and when I need, I do some swapping and so on, okay, which we will we'll cover. All right. So what we want is, uh, so, so the whole idea is like you have this huge storage, okay, uh, and then you have a smaller storage which you want to carry around. And then you carry around only what you currently need. Okay. Okay, so let's come back to the idea of process. So we understand a process is an instance of a running program. Okay, that means, okay, for example, when you, when you launch your web browser, correct? So that is a process. There is an instance of the web browser's code. Okay, so the actual 
uh, web browser's code, okay, is is a, is an application that is residing on your hard disk. Okay, every time you want to launch an instance of it, okay, you double click on it, it opens up. That is an instance. That's a process. All right. So each process, okay, when each time you open up a new browser, a new browser, what happens? Okay, your process, each process will always be considered independent. All right, because what you do on one browser does not affect the other browser. Okay, you can run different things on each browser separately. Okay. Why? Because each of them seems to have exclusive use of the processor, and you also have their own exclusive use of the main memory. Okay, I mean that's what it seems. All right, and it seems like that because of the way the multi-threading works, and also because of what we call the virtual address uh, idea that is actually implemented. Okay, so how how do we do this? Okay, so in terms of the process memory, okay, whenever you create a program, okay. Okay, when you run that instance of a program, it means you create a process. That process has all these elements inside. That means it has your text element, which is your code. Okay, it has your data and DSS. Okay, so the difference between data and DSS is data is for initialized global and static variables, whereas DSS is for uninitialized global and static variables. Okay, then you have your heap and stack. Okay, stack is whenever you jump to a function and you want to create some local variables there okay then you want to push and pop also your return address and things like that a uh, heap is when you use uh, commands like malloc okay so if you're familiar with malloc okay basically you create a uh, or you request for some memory during runtime all right when you click when you create an array in your code okay so when you create an array in your code for example integer x Okay, 1024. Then you already upfront say that I need 1024 uh, size of data, the size of integers, uh, blocks to uh, be reserved for this variable x. Okay, but if you're not sure how much memory you need, and you can only determine that in one time, then you use things like malloc. Okay, and malloc, when you ever use malloc, you will occupy memory on what we call the heap of the process. Now, how does virtual memory actually help? Okay, so the program, what it does, it, it actually refers to what we call a virtual memory address. All right, and what happens is, okay, from the virtual memory address, you actually create a mapping to the physical address. Okay, so let, let me just show you this. Okay, so technically what happens? In your system, okay, you may have a 64-bit system, okay, or 32-bit system, whatever. So when you have a 64-bit system, okay, for example, that means you have a total of 64-bit uh, address space. Okay, so what do you mean by 64-bit address space? Okay, just to give you an example, if I say I have 8-bit address space, that means it is going all the way from Zero 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 all the way to one 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 one. Okay, so in terms of the actual memory locations, it is two hundred fifty six different addresses. Okay, in terms of the uh, unique addresses in the eight bit addressing system. So if I scale that up to sixty four bits, okay, that is equal to sixteen exabytes of uh, address locations. That your processor would be able to access. Okay, but in reality, you only have probably a few gigabytes of main memory. Okay, much, much smaller than the actual amount of space that my system can access. So, how do I deal with this? All right, and the other thing that you also need to understand is. Within the uh, application that we are running, all right, we have a lot of processors. All right, so we can open multiple processors as many as we need. All right, and each time you open a process, we also need to set aside the stack, the heap, the code, okay, the data segment, everything associated with each process. All right, so every time I open up a browser, that browser will have. To have enough of memory to store all the 
uh, information associated with that process. Then open up another time, again, another set of uh, memory is required. Okay, so how do I manage this? How do I know what goes where okay, within the main physical memory? Okay, and another issue is how can I protect memory if two different processors try to access it at the same time? Okay, is there a way for me to protect any access? And also, how do I share? Okay, so maybe I have a common uh, sort of page in the memory that I would like different processors to access concurrently. How can I share this information? So these are all things that we need to uh, worry about. Right? So the first thing is, how do I fit a huge memory into a tiny physical memory? So this huge memory is the actual virtual memory. But physically, I only have a small amount of memory. Okay, how can I manage the space required? I have so many processes, right? so many things that are running concurrently. How do I manage this? Okay, How can I ensure that I protect my own personal memory space? And how can I allow sharing of common parts of the memory? Okay, so this is basically the idea, which is what we call the indirection. That means instead of saying that I directly talk to an address, I what I do is I talk to a box, and that box is what I'm interested in, but the box can reference different addresses at different times. Okay, so that is the idea of indirection. So what does that mean? Okay, so in terms of uh, virtual memory, what it does is I know that when I create any process, I need a certain amount of memory. I create another process, I need a certain amount of memory. Okay. So what I need to do is I know that every time I create a process, I need a certain amount of memory. But physically, I have a amount of memory that is much smaller than all the processes that are possible. Correct, it's much smaller than all the processes that are possible. So what I need to do, I need to be able to say that okay, when I launch process one, I must be able to map it. Okay, so a mapping needs to be done for process one, for example, to be allocated a certain part of the memory. Okay, then when process two comes along, and then it says, okay, process two is supposed to write, it needs some memory. Okay, I allocate another set of easier for process two and so on. Okay, so this mapping is to allow us okay, to, to have this layer where the process will be able to run without having to worry about actually where it is in the, in the physical memory. Why? Because the mapping will ensure that it points to a particular space that is reserved for it. Okay, so every time I need a process, I need to launch a process, I need some memory, the mapping will do this indirection for me so that I will be allocated a certain part of the physical memory for the process to run. Okay, so in terms of this mapping, how do we do the mapping? Okay, so we need to understand this idea of the address space. Okay, so let's look at this. So we have two address spaces. One is what we call the virtual address space. The other is the physical address space. Okay, so in terms of virtual address space, what do we have? We have, uh, again, depend on how many bits. So if I say I have n bits, then I have to the power of n virtual addresses. Okay, and for the physical address, if I have m bits, then I have to the power of m physical addresses. Okay, so it's always the case where you have virtual address bigger than physical address. Okay, that's the main reason why we want to have this uh, mapping in the first place. Okay, so in a system that uses virtual addressing, what happens? Okay, in a system that uses virtual addressing, your processor, okay, will generate an address. Okay, but it will generate a virtual address that will go into what we call the MMU, okay, which is the memory management unit. Okay, and what does this MMU do for us? It actually helps to translate your virtual address 
to what we call a physical address. Okay, and then from there, it gives that, extracts out that data, okay, that we need, okay, from the memory space and passes it back to the processor. Okay, so the whole idea of virtual addressing is we don't really have to know what is the physical address, okay? We just need to know the virtual address and the MMU, okay, is supposed to take care of this first. Okay, so how does this work? All right, so in terms of virtual memory, okay, we can say that we need to first break up the memory into what we call blocks or what is commonly known as pages. Okay, so when we say we break it up into pages, that means instead of looking at it as one big chunk, we break it up into a certain number of pages of equal size. All right, so what happens is your physical memory has a certain number of pages. Your virtual memory also has a certain number of pages. And what I need to do is I will map my virtual memory pages to the appropriate physical memory pages. Okay, so the virtual pages will be mapped to the physical pages. Okay, so that is what we need to do. Okay, to do a mapping between the virtual and the physical. Okay, so in terms of a virtual memory page. Yeah. Okay. okay, so in terms of virtual memory page, okay, there are three states that we need to look at. One is un unallocated, one is uncached, the other is cached. Okay, so if it's unallocated means it is not being used by the process. If it's uncached means it is used but it's not cached. Cache means it is used and it is cached in the VRAM. Okay, so what do we mean by this? So you can see down here that in the virtual address space, okay, I have all of these blocks, okay, and different pages. Okay, each of this is a page, and each page here maps to some particular physical address, and it doesn't have to go in sequence. Okay, you can see the arrows here. Okay, suddenly I can point to somewhere else. Okay, like this arrow. It doesn't have to be in sequence. Okay, why? Because all of this is taken care of within the MMU, okay, which is your virtual address maps to which physical address. Okay, so it doesn't have to go in sequence. Okay, now, if you look at all of these blocks here that are highlighted, these are the ones that belong to the process. Okay, that means I'm launching this application right now, my browser, my uh, media player or something. So that application that I'm launching is now going to occupy this amount of text, the data and stack, and all of this is mapping to certain regions, certain pages in my physical address space. Okay, now a virtual address can be mapped to either physical memory or the disk. Okay, so what happens? Okay, so first let's look at this uh, example here on how to do some calculations, all right? And then we'll have a better idea of the mapping. Now, if I have this 16 kilobyte virtual address space, okay, 16 kilobyte virtual address space, how many uh, bits do I allocate? Okay, so if I have 16 kilobyte, okay, that is 16 times 1024. Okay, so if you use a calculator, okay, so let me open up my calculator here. Okay, so 16 kilobyte is 16 times 1024. Okay, that is 16 kilobytes. So what you need to do is you need to, to figure out how many bits is needed to represent 16 kilobytes. So if you take two to the power of 14, okay, you'll get 16K. Okay. So 2 to the power of 14 gives me 16k means I need a total of uh, 14 bits to represent this virtual address. Okay, similar for the 4 kilobyte. Okay, so 4 kilobyte is 2 to the power of 12. Okay, so I have 4 kilobyte, 4 times 1024. Okay, so the first thing is we can see that I need to translate the size of my 
virtual address and physical address to number of bits that I need. Okay, so if I were to draw it out, basically this is how it look like. So it's something like this. Okay, so this is the virtual address space and this is the physical address space. Okay, and this whole thing is 16 kilobyte. And this whole thing here is 4 kilobyte. Okay, now in terms of the mapping, okay, as what we saw, we do mapping in terms of pages. Okay, so here we are given that we have a page size of 64 bytes. So when we say a page size 64 bytes means then every time I transfer data, okay, from my physical memory, okay, uh, uh, to my processor, it is always in terms of page size. Okay, so that is the minimum number of bytes, okay, or minimum memory uh, size that we will access whenever we have a page sheet. So if I say that my page size is 64 bytes, how many pages do I have? That will be, in terms of the virtual space, is 16 kilobytes divided by 64, which is 256. That means over here, I have a total of 256, from 0, 1, all the way to 255. Okay, so a total of 256 different virtual pages here. Okay, in terms of the physical, okay, I will have 64. Okay, 4 kilobytes over 64, I have 64 different uh, pages here. That means from 0, 1, all the way to 63. Okay, so I have 256 pages of virtual memory space mapping to 64 pages of the physical address space. Okay, so in terms of the number of bits, okay, to represent this information, what I need to do is, first I need to look at how many bits do I need to represent in terms of the page. Okay, so you can see that the page size is consistent, all right? The page size is 64 bytes. Both for virtual address is both 64 bytes. Okay, so for 64 bytes, how many bits do I represent? Okay, so again, you can use a calculator. Okay, so you will see that 2 to the power of 6 will give me 64. Okay, if so if 2 to the power of 6 gives me 64, that means, okay, I need 6 bits to represent the 64 different locations within the page. Okay, I need six bits to represent the 64 different locations within each page. Okay, so that is the same thing for both virtual address and physical address. So that is why we call that the page offset. So the page offset is the same, okay, for the uh, virtual and physical. So this is to the power of six. So I need six bits for both the virtual address and physical address. All right, so if I set aside six bits for the page offset, then the remaining is what we call the bits for the actual virtual and physical address. Okay, so in terms of the uh, virtual page number, you have a total of eight bits here, and here another six bits. Because here and here is six and six. Okay, so basically what happens is, since my page size is 64 bytes, I will set aside six bits for the page offset for both virtual address and physical address. Okay, and with that, the balance, all right, that means 14 minus six, I'll get eight. So the remaining eight bits is used for the virtual page number and for the physical is 12 minus six, which is six. So that's for the physical page number. Okay, so in terms of the translation, okay, what happens? Okay, so in terms of translation, as you can see here, what is happening is the, within the DRAM, okay, we will maintain what we call a page table. Okay, so this page table is basically a table of entries. Okay, and what it will do is, it will map a particular uh, entry, to the physical address, okay, or 
to I mean to the physical DRAM or to the virtual disk. Okay, is it a hash table? Okay, so it is more of a you, you can think of it as a hash table because a hash table also is, is does something similar, right? You, you relate one input to one output. Okay, but this is more of uh, having the, uh, the what you call a valid. So it, it contains two bits of information. One is what you call a valid bit, and the other is the actual mapping of the address. Okay, so this valid bit is what this valid bit has two values, correct? It's either one or zero. So when it is one, it means that it you have a copy of this physical uh, of, of this memory in the DRAM. Okay, you have a copy of this data in the DRAM. Okay, but if the valid bit is zero, then it does not have a copy. That means it is actually the data that you want is actually on the disk in the hard disk drive. Okay, so what we need to do is whenever there is a uh, memory access, you will come to this table first. Okay, we'll come to this page table to try and see whether I have a copy of the data that I want within my DRAM. So it maps to a location in the DRAM. If I have it, then I can take it straight away. But if I don't have it, then I know it's in the memory, it means in the hard disk. Then I need to do something else, okay, which we will look at. All right, so in terms of page table, okay, what happens is you have one page table per process, okay, and they are stored within the uh, DRAM itself. Okay, so within the DRAM, you will need some space to, to store this page table. And what the page table does is it contains the mapping okay, between the virtual page and the actual uh, physical page that it maps to. All right, so is either you have it in your physical page or you don't have it, which will be uh, seen from the valid bit. Okay. So this is an example of a page table where you have a physical page number. Okay. Uh, for every particular entry in the table. Okay. And if you don't have a physical page number, that means it is on the hard disk. So the valid bit is zero. As long as the value bit is one, then the physical page number has a value. Okay. So let's look at uh, this page table. How big is this page table? All right. So we know that, okay, all this is what we calculated just now. All right. So we say that 16 kilobytes is the virtual address space, 4 kilobytes is the physical address space. Okay. And page size is 64. All right. And from just now, what we saw, we, we already saw that we need six bits, okay, for each physical page uh, uh, in terms of the uh, page uh, size, uh, within the page size uh, allocation. And for the physical pages also, we have another six bits. Your 64 is also to the power of six. All right, so what does the page table contain? So the page table contains two information, all right, one is the physical page number and the valid bit. All right, so this physical page number is the number of bits, depends on the number of bits that I need to represent the page number. So in our case, I need six bits to represent the physical page number. Okay, at the same time, I need one more bit to say whether it's valid or not. Okay, so that means I need a total of seven bits for each page table entry. And since my virtual uh, page, uh, I have a total of 256, that means I need 256 page table entries. Okay, I need 256 page table entries, that means 256 times seven is basically 1792 bits. That's the total size of the, uh, of the amount of space I need for this page table to be stored in my memory. Okay, so let's look at this, all right, and have a better idea of what and how this whole thing works. All right, so when I want to access any address, okay, so what happens is, the first thing that happens is, when I want to access any address, the process will generate a virtual address for me. Okay, that means within the OS, when it wants to access anything uh, associated with this process, it will 
generate the virtual address of where you want to get data from. All right. So when it generates this virtual address, okay, the OS will now need to translate this virtual address to a physical address. So how can you do that? So the first thing you will do is you will first extract out the page offset. Okay, the page offset number of bits is the same for physical and virtual. Okay, because that is the page size. It depends on the page size. Okay, so when the system is already designed, okay, the OS will already set the page size. So since we know the page size, we know exactly how many number of bits we need to access uh, all the bytes within the page. So we know how many bits we need for the page offset. All right, so that is the first thing I want to extract. So the virtual page offset, that number of bits is the same number of bits I will use for the physical page offset. All right, so the, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is, I have my remaining bits of the virtual address, which is actually my virtual page number. And what does my virtual page number do? It points me to the page table. Okay, it points me to the page table. So if a value, if this value is zero, you point to entry zero. If this value is a one, you will point to entry one and so on. Okay, so this virtual page number, again, depends on how many pages there are. Okay, so if I have 256 uh, pages, okay, then I will have 256 different entries in my page table. Okay, so it will point to one entry in my page table. Okay, now if my, if I point, okay, so let's say I, I'm having a virtual page number of one and I point to entry one, correct? And if my valid bit is set, okay, if my valid bit is set, then what do I do? Then I know that the data or the address that I want to reference, that information is already captured within the page table. So I can take that information, combine it with my page offset, and that will give me the final address of where I'm supposed to get my data from within the DRAM. Okay, so this physical address is the address of where I need to get my data from and is within the DRAM. Okay, if the valid bit is zero, okay, then it is not there. That means it's not in my DRAM. Okay, it's not in my DRAM. Okay, so we will look at that in a while, what we should do. But if my valid bit is zero, then it is not in my DRAM. And then I need to do some other action to uh, take the correct data from the hard disk. Okay, so if my data valid bit is set. Okay, so in this example, my virtual address is pointing to a place where the valid bit is one. If my valid bit is one, then I know where I'm pointing to. So that information I can straight away take. Okay, and pass it back to my process. Okay, the, the information in that DRAM. Okay, what if I point to a entry in the page table? But the valid bit is zero. So just now, if it is there, we call it a page hit. If it is not there, we say it is a page four. Okay, so in a page four, what happens is you're trying to access or reference a virtual memory, but it is not, okay, it is not in the physical memory. Okay, so if it's not in the physical memory, then what happens? Okay, that means it is still in my disk. All right, it's still in my hard disk. It's not transferred yet to my virtual memory. So that's why it is pointing to some location within the virtual memory. So what do I need to do when a page fault occurs? I need to do a few things. So firstly, I need to uh, raise an exception. So this is again managed in the back end by the OS. So you need to worry about it. But once the page fault occurs, the OS is aware, okay, that something is wrong with this memory access. So what you will do is you must load the correct page from the hard disk to the DRAM. And once it does that, since I'm now updating the DRAM with some new information, I also need to modify the page table entry, okay, to correspond to the new mapping of the virtual page to the physical page. 
Okay, and then I will go back and rerun the instruction. Okay, and in the second try, what will happen? It will be successful because I have already loaded the correct page from the memory. Okay, so what happens is when I initially point to a page table entry where the value is zero, okay, then I need to uh, raise an exception. So when I raise the exception, I know that this page that I want needs to be loaded to my physical memory. Okay, so since I loaded to my physical memory, then I will need to select a victim to be removed. Okay, so of course, if my uh, DRAM still has pages that are empty. Okay, if it still has empty slots, then it will naturally point to an empty slot. Okay, again, depends on how you design the system. But if there's an empty slot, it may point to an empty slot and you may occupy that slot. Okay, but if it is full, then it will have its own sort of uh, protocol of deciding which one to remove. Okay, so it may remove the oldest one. Or the least used one. Okay, again depends on some policy within the OS. Okay, so you may choose to evict one of the pages and replace that with the new page. Okay, so what will happen is you will you can select, for example, virtual page four to remove that, and once it is done, you will update it with the new page, which is virtual page three. Okay, and since now virtual page three is uh, residing in the DRAM, you will also update the page table entry that now it is valid. So the valid bit is set and the correct mapping of the page number to the uh, physical, virtual page number to the physical page number will be there. Okay, and then when you restart that instruction that caused the, or memory access that caused the fault, then in the second retry, it will be successful. Okay, so that is basically how the page fault works. All right, and once you restart it, the second instance, you will get a, what you call a page hit. Okay, again, comes back to the same concept as just now. Why does it work? Okay, why does it work? Is because of this concept of locality. That means there is always this concept that when I am, working on some, executing some code, I will most likely execute code that is nearby. When I accessing some data, there's a high chance I'll also access data that is nearby. Okay, so, th so the whole idea is that uh, page size, okay, and that I access, that data will be used for a period of time before I need to go to a next page and next page and so on. Okay. Uh, of course, it always uh, may not be true. Okay, it depends on how maybe you design the system and things like that. Okay, but generally, I would say in most cases, this idea of locality works. Okay, and uh, again, because it works, is why our processors and OS also continue to support this. Okay, now when I have uh, multiple processors, okay, how do I manage it? Okay, so again, you have uh, different virtual addresses that may point to a same common page. Okay, and why does this work? For example, uh, in cases where you have uh, a read-only library code. Okay, so for example, your virtual address space for browser, correct? You open one browser and then you open another browser. Okay, they are both the same instance of the same uh, application, or I mean two different instances of the same application, but they may have a common or some common library code, okay, that can be shared. Okay, so in that case, your process may choose to map, okay, your OS may choose to map uh, some of these virtual addresses to a common uh, physical address. Okay, so you can actually manage this quite well. All right, so basically what it does is it allows us to resolve this memory allocation issues without having to worry about it because the OS actually manages it everything in the back end. Okay, so it doesn't uh, cause uh, what you call the external fragmentation. Okay, so we do not go into details of this, but 
in terms of memory usage I would, what we can say is it manages the memory a lot better than we try to do it ourselves okay so in terms of sharing okay we have this okay in terms of protection okay we also have the idea that once we allocate certain processes uh, uh, to a particular physical space another process cannot access it so for example if I have process one and process two, okay, it has its own set of virtual memory addresses that maps to its own physical space. So, for example, this process one, virtual page one, maps to physical page two. And this process two has virtual page one, maps to physical page eight. Okay, so there is a protection in a sense that there is no way process two might access physical page two or process one can access physical page eight it will not happen all right so whatever that is shared they have we have a common page but other than that they have their own personal sort of private space so to avoid any form of corruption okay and within the processor itself okay the mmu also has its own layer of checking by what we call uh having uh, certain bits that are set or clear all right so what you can do is within the process the os may set certain permission levels okay so for example when i take access to physical page six okay i can uh, i am not allowed to write code for example i mean i'm not allowed to write any uh, data to this uh, space physical page six Okay, why? Because physical page six is a shared. Okay, so there is no write access allowed. All right, whereas uh, in this case, this physical page nine that I mapped to is a private space. Okay, for process J, so I'm allowed to do write access. Okay, so the um, permission bits, okay, can be extended to the page table entry so previously when we talk about page table entry we only talk about the valid okay but we can extend it okay to say that okay you can uh, operate in supervisor mode you can operate uh, you can do a right access you can execute code and so on so you can set some other uh, bits to indicate what is allowed what is not allowed within that memory region okay so this again provides a protection layer so that one process does not accidentally try to access a physical page, okay, memory set aside for another process. Okay, so let's look at the uh, address translation. So in terms of address translation, we have the page hit. Okay, so when you talk about page hit, what happens? You send out the first virtual address to the MMU, then you gather the table, right? So the, the table is over here. Okay, the page table uh, is over here. So you need to first send the address over and then capture the actual uh, mapping of the virtual to the physical. Okay, so that is two and three. So once I get the actual address, then I send it out and then I get the data here. Okay, the actual data here. Now, what happens if there's a fault? Okay, so if there's a fault, what happens? Then there's another extra layer, right? Because when I send the address over the page table entry, so this is the page table over here. I send the page table entry here. I get back the actual address. But then once I get back the address, okay, when I try to access it, it will be a failure, right? Because it is not in my actual DRAM. Then I raise the exception. After raise the exception, then I need to do the swap. I just know what we did. That means one page has to go out and a new page has to come in. And then I restart the instruction and then I get a page hit. Okay, so you can see that it is quite slow. Correct? Even when I look at it, it also sounds a bit slow. There is a lot of steps involved. Okay, why? Because I every time need to uh, access the memory twice. Okay, so you can see that I always need to access the memory twice. This is the first time. And this is the second time. Okay. Uh, why? First time I need to access because the page table is also in the memory. So first I need to access the page table. Once I get back the address, then I need to go back to the memory to get the actual data. Okay, so there is always two access. Okay, that I need to do. 
All right, and if I have a uh, page uh, four, then it adds some more layers. All right, if I need to uh, load from the hard disk and then restart the instruction and things like that. Okay, so this is of course another issue to deal with. Okay, how can I make this better? So the whole idea of making it better now is to add another layer of cache. Okay, within the MMU, that means within the processor itself, so that you do not have to go to the DRAM to look at the table. You take a subset of the table and keep it within the MMU. So that is what we call a translation look aside buffer. So what we're doing, we know that I have this entire table. So in this case, I have 256 entries okay, inside my DRAM. Okay? But I do not want to every time go here to access this table and then go back and come back again to access the data. So what I do within my processor itself, I have a smaller subset of that, which is called the on-chip PLB. Okay. So I take a subset of that and put it within my chip. Okay. So that whenever I have any memory access, what I do is I access it within the processor first. So again, this is within the chip. So as far as within the chip, it's very fast. It's just like a register access. Okay, it's very, very fast. So what I will do is, whenever I want to access any memory, I check here first. If I get the mapping within here, then I can straight away put the physical address out and get it. Okay, so it means that I only need to do one access to the actual DRAM. Okay, but what if there is a miss? Okay, so let's look at it over here first. So whenever I want to access with page table in the DRAM, what do I do? Okay, I take the data from the virtual address, take the page offset, map it to my current physical uh, address. Then the virtual page number points to one entry over here. Then I take the data from that entry in the page table, combine it with my data from the page offset, and then I get my actual physical address. So that is the address that I'm supposed to access. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, if I have a page, a translation look aside buffer, what I do is, I instead of going to my memory, okay, at least I don't go to my DRAM, Okay, on hard disk. What I try to do is I straight away try to look inside my translation look aside buffer. This is within my chip, so it's very fast. Okay, so the moment my virtual page number points to a valid entry, okay, I can straight away take the data, combine it, and get my actual address. Okay, where I'm supposed to access. Okay, but what if there's a miss? If there's a miss, then of course, then I go through the process of taking the data from the memory and updating my look aside buffer. Okay, so again, why, why do we want to do this and why it works is coming back to the concept of locality. That means there's always more cases of uh, having data and, and code that is considered localized, that means it's quite regularly accessed in, in most applications, which allows the use of this to be uh, more efficient than compared to always going out to the DRAM to get the uh, data. Okay, so if, if it's a miss, there are additional steps. Okay, you need to go out, get the data, and bring it back in. But because of the fact that you don't really uh, have that as often as the hits, the overall gains are still better. Okay, so if you put everything together, okay, put everything together, okay, this is sort of the bigger picture. All right, that means whenever a CPU, when you're writing, uh, executing code and you want to access anything from the memory, the first step is within the processor itself, you look at the MMU and the look aside buffer. Okay, if there is a hit, okay, if there's a hit means I can straight away access that data, okay, and take it from the main memory back. Okay, 
if, if there's a miss, okay, if there's a miss, then I need to go to my page table. This page table is in the actual DRAM, okay, and then update my local buffer, restart the instruction, and then take it, okay, from the translation uh, from the main from the main memory, okay. If I have another page fault, okay, where I try to access the page uh, direct memory, then I need to go to the hard disk storage. Okay, so that is what we call a segmentation fault. That means I try to access a memory, okay, from uh, through the DRAM, but it's not in the DRAM, it's still in the hard disk. All right, so I need to issue a page fault. Okay, on the page form, then I get an updated value from the hard disk back to my uh, main memory, which is this page swap. Okay, and then I update my page table. And then I restart my instruction, and then I get the actual data. Okay, so you, you might think that why is it so complicated? Okay, why do I have so many different layers? Okay, again, it comes back to the same thing. If I don't have all of this, correct? And I just say that, why don't I just take CPU, talk directly to hard disk, okay? Or directly talk to just DRAM. Then you have a system that is very, very slow. Okay, like the system very, very slow because your CPU is very fast, okay, compared to your DRAM and hard disk. Okay, so in order to speed things up as much as possible, we want to keep subsets of the data and the program as close as possible to the processor. So that is where the MMU, the TLB, the DRAM, everything comes in. Okay, so we want to keep subsets of data that is regularly used as close as possible to make your access a lot faster. All right, So that you don't have to be always very slow. You can be very, very fast for most of the time, and whenever there is a miss, then you go out and you get the updated data. Okay, so that, that is the whole idea of virtual memory. Okay, we're trying to take uh, this multiple processors that we have, and we're trying to maximize the use of the limited physical DRAM that we have. Okay, but at the same time, we also want to minimize DRAM access as much as possible, so the concept of the MMU and the TLB comes in. Okay, so that we take a subset of that and bring it into the processor to make it as fast as possible. Okay, then if there's a miss, then we go out. If there's another miss, then we go out and so on. Okay, so that sort of wraps up the whole idea of virtual memory. Okay, uh, so again, the whole virtual memory and everything, there's a lot more details you can go into if you go into uh, how you design uh, the whole uh, memory system, the cache and everything, okay? But I think for this module, what we want is to give all of you the idea of how this works, okay? And of course, like I said, this is handled in the back end by the OS, correct? Uh, so it's transparent to us, but it's good that we understand that this is actually happening in the back end. Okay, so uh, in summary, basically, uh, when we write a program, all right? Uh, we always think of every process as uh, a private linear address space, in a sense. All right, that means when, when we write a thread, we write a process, we think of it, okay, this is a process that will run, it will have its own memory space, its own address space, okay? But the virtual memory system that is managed by the OS actually helps us to manage all these virtual memory pages, ensure that you can do the sharing, ensure that you have protection and so on. Okay, so all of this is handled in the back end for us through the OS. Okay, so that sort of uh, wraps up the whole uh, chapter here, all right? Um, okay, so uh, I mean, we will have some practice questions. Uh, I didn't want to put anything today, okay, because I think uh, we, we need time to go through the material and understand before we have further discussion with some questions, all right? So that's why I'm pushing the, the discussion of the questions and tutorial to next week. Okay, so I'm just going to flash this one more time on the final exam, okay, which is what we discussed last week. Okay, so the final exam will be face-to-face, uh, -face, okay, as per exam schedule. Okay, so if you're not sure, uh, 
you can check in Luminous. Luminous also has the exam uh, schedule okay, for each module. Okay, it will be an open book exam. Okay, so open book means uh, any hard copy material you can bring in. Okay, your notes, textbooks, uh, whatever you want to bring in, you can bring in. Okay, but only hard copy material. That means you're not allowed to bring in any uh, sort of computing device. You can't bring in a, a tablet and say, oh, this one got no Wi-Fi. I can just use to look at my notes. You're not allowed to do that. Okay, as long as it's hard copy material, you can bring. Okay, no, uh, any. No, no device that has a soft copy or any computing platform. Okay, so all chapters are considered covered. All right. Uh, so format will be MCQ plus uh, short answer questions. Okay, and you will be okay. So as part of the questions, some of it you need to analyze some code. You need to write some code and so on. All right. So again, uh, next week, okay, I will be going through the. Uh, the tutorial questions, the last tutorial question, plus uh, some uh, past year questions. Okay, so for us to discuss and have an idea of uh, how the exam is structured. Okay, so that is uh, about it. Okay, so for today, th that's all we have. Uh, what I will do is I will continue to stay on uh, to answer uh, questions and uh, doubts that you have about uh, the assignment or the term paper. Uh, before we end for today uh, yeah so does anybody have anything they want to ask or clarify okay so the folder has already been created okay so i can share here okay so under the files i already created the assignment to submission Okay, so for assignment two, you just need to submit uh, the folder that, uh, I mean, the file with your code in it. Okay, uh, just uh, make sure you have labeled it, label your file name as uh, your name and your student number and so on. Okay, so you just need to submit uh, that file where you have your code changes in it. Okay, uh, and that should be fine. If you, have, if you have made changes in more than one file, then uh, you submit them as a zip. Okay. Um, no, you know, you know, you need to submit the solution file, you just submit the C file is enough. Okay. So you would have made changes in uh, generally the, the main main.c. Okay, and the app config.h. Okay, so you just need to submit those two main files. Okay, so you can just zip them up together and submit those two files main.c and app config.h. Okay. Okay, so that is for assignment two. The, so the assignment two de deadline is set as uh, 14 April. That means uh, week 13, uh, the Thursday. Okay, for term paper submission, it is set on uh, 8 April. Okay. Uh, I've also created a late folder. Okay, so this late folder submission again from the beginning already I put there. Okay, so that is until the um, uh, 22nd April. That means anything uh, that you miss the deadline, you just put under late folder. Okay, so again, this is to make sure that you do not. Uh, uh, email me any solution, okay? Because uh, if you email me, there's a high chance uh, you may get lost, okay? So if you put everything in the, the late folder submission, uh, it's easier for, for you and me to keep track that it has been submitted. Okay, so you want to push the term paper to 10. Okay, that is fine. Uh, two days should be fine. Okay, so I can change that to 10th April, no problem. Okay, so we will change the term, uh, term paper submission. We will update to 10th April. Uh, I might as well do it now.
Okay, so for term paper, okay, just uh, you you need to provide instructions. Uh, the, the instructions that you need to support should be up to you, correct? As long as uh, again, if you look at term paper, you need to provide justification for what it supports, uh, how many bits you set aside for what. Okay, so if you do not want to have function field, you do not want to have shift. That's all up to you. Okay, you can decide uh, that. Okay, based on uh, how you want to or what you want to support. Okay, so it's fine to say that the processor is not going to support shift function. Okay, or it's not going to support some particular uh, function. Okay, so it's it's a it's a decision that you will make, correct? Because uh, uh, you are designing it. Okay, so you don't need to worry about the pointer, stack pointer, or, or anything like that. Okay, so you can take it that the registers that you are going to use are going to be strictly for the coding alone. Okay, so you do not need to worry about setting aside registers for other stuff. Okay. I mean, you should try to maximize the uh, the, the the bits that you have, correct? To to provide as much functionality as possible. Okay, so if you can say your processor supports more instructions, then it's better. Uh, tips as in uh, I'm not sure what, what you mean by tips. Okay, so I, I think you already discussed the idea, right? How you're supposed to design what you need to do. Okay, in terms of the architecture, the drawing, uh, you can just copy from the MIPS design, correct? The overall architecture design, and then you can make modifications uh, from there, okay, on how you want your processor to look like. I mean, they, uh, I would say there's no particular restriction on what, what to look out for because uh, as long as your processor, you can support uh, uh, the basic instructions that you can, uh, is expected of a processor and you have enough instructions to uh, perform the action, okay, which is uh, solving the, the square of the number, then I think that is a, uh, that is good enough. Okay, so it is not, uh, you don't need to overthink uh, it too much. Okay, so like I said, you just, have to make some decisions only, correct? It means from 32 bit, you come down to 82, uh, 18 bit, all right? So you need to cut some things off and with whatever is left, then you decide how many instructions you support, how you want to use the opcodes, okay? And, uh, uh, and, uh, and as long as the instructions support the requirement, then you're more or less there already, correct? Yeah, to, to compute the square, uh, again, you are going to do it using your own set of instructions. So there is no fixed way to it, right? So you have to decide based on the instructions that your processor supports. Okay, I mean, if you want some feedback, you can just email me, all right? But I can only give some general uh, guidelines, okay? Because this is a graded uh, submission, okay? So I can give some general guideline on uh, 
uh, or feedback, okay, uh, if you send it to me. Okay, so um, yeah, so next week we will still have the last class, all right, um, for the tutorial and the uh, some exam questions. Okay, so uh, it's a question whether you need to do a write up on how branch go I mean, if you think that uh, the write up will work, that is fine, all right. So you just need to make sure that everything is within the the page limit. And then uh, what and the, the report limit that is uh, given. Okay, so I mean, uh, uh, some some explanation on uh, how your processor might work. Okay, in terms of executing instructions, uh, will definitely help. Okay, so that uh, I can understand how you have designed your processor. Okay. Uh, NX as in uh, basically everything has to be confined within the page limit. Okay, you you, you don't need to have additional stuff, but right? because the only thing you need to include is uh, uh, your overall uh, architecture. I mean the decisions you've made, what it supports, all right, and uh, the code. Okay, for the requirement as well as the diagram of the processor architecture. Okay, so uh, assignment two, what must you submit? You basically submit the files that uh, you have changed, which is your main and your app config. Okay, architecture design, you don't have to use one full page, all right? You can always uh squeeze it to about half a page okay so you need to occupy the full page okay if you put it on the microsoft word document i think uh, half a page should be fine yeah so for term paper i think the lecture notes as reference is more than enough okay you don't need to Put anything Okay, so um, any any other questions? Anything you want to ask? Uh, yeah, week 13, there will be no class. Okay, so next week will be the last class where we will have our last tutorial and uh, we will go through some uh, past year questions. Okay, so I'll send them, I'll send the tutorial and the uh, questions uh, 
this week. Okay, so you can look through them. So next week we can have a discussion on that. Okay, so yeah, if you have other questions, you can just uh, let me know. If not, uh, yeah, I'll see you all next week, okay, for the final class.
Okay, so does anybody have anything else they want to ask? Okay, so it looks like nothing else. I'll see you all next week. Okay, so if you still have anything, uh, you can always uh, email me or text me. Okay, thank you. Bye.